Welcome to the Inside the Boards podcast, the podcast dedicated to helping you learn to think like a question writer so you can study smarter, not harder, and succeed in medical school. And now here's your host, Patrick Beeman. You're listening to an archived episode of our 2017 Study Smarter series for the USMLE Step 1 and Comlex Level 1. We have a very esteemed guest here, Dr. Conrad Fisher, who... Woohoo, Conrad! Yay! Woohoo! He's here to talk today about the live online Cramathon, which is going to be held May 7th, and then do a little bit about pharmacology so you can learn on the go. Dr. Fisher, thank you for taking the time to be here. Dr. Beeman, so happy to be here and so happy to be out in the universe with everybody listening to me now and you so that we are not wasting a second because right now while you are brushing your teeth, while you're driving your car, we want you to learn things. So the point of the Cramathon is that you can't all be here with me in New York City or the couple of places around the country I do live. So the Cramathon is a 12-hour experience of going through the best, highest yield material that you can get for your USMLE. And in addition, it allows us to do a sample through all the specialties. So we're going to do an hour, two hours of physiology. We're going to do an hour of pharmacology. We're going to do one, two hours of microbiology. We're going to do an hour or two of biochemistry. We're going to do an hour or two of pathology. We are going to go across the specialties in the world of basic science for USMLE step one. And more importantly, we're going to teach you how to be your own Conrad Fisher. You need to become independent of us. At the end of the day, the teacher is not judged based on how many students he had, but on how many teachers he created. So you can think of this Cramathon as something that you can do from the privacy of your home, wearing your pajamas, eating soup, hanging around with your family and friends if you want to, and it will reach you anywhere in the world. So the Cramathon is like a marathon, and it is to be able to make sure that you have seen materials across specialties. Then at the end of the day, we will use special integrated cases. Special integrated cases at the end will show you how to synthesize all that material where you can take a single disease, let's say ulcer disease, and we can show you the physiology of how acid is produced. But maybe they don't ask you that on your USMLA. They give you the patient with epigastric discomfort, and they might ask you the diagnosis, and they might not. They give you the person with epigastric discomfort that's better or worse with pain, and maybe some blood in the stool, and they ask you, what is the most likely diagnosis? <sighs> oh, but the person sitting in the booth next to you when you're taking your test gets the same ulcer question. But instead of them asking him what's the most likely diagnosis, they ask him what is the mechanism of acid production. And your answer will have to be histamine or gastrin or vagal stimulation. All three of those things stimulate the proton pump. Oh, you might be asked which of those is the most important of those stimulants, and you'll have to say it's the histamine. But the person at the next booth, he's getting the same root case of a 32-year-old man with epigastric discomfort, maybe some blood in the stool, maybe some pain with or without food, and he doesn't get asked the diagnosis. He doesn't get asked the physiology of acid production. He gets asked the biochemistry of how helicobacter pylori splits urea into ammonia that splits the urea with the urease. What is the mechanism of the biochemistry of splitting that urea? It's urease. And then ammonia eats your acid. Yes, my ammonia eats your acid. It makes ammonia um. Because when I eat my acid, it's um. Ammonia eats your acid. And then you get ammonia um. Because I like that acid. 
Oh, well, maybe the person at the next booth, they're not being asked a biochemistry question. They, they're not being asked a biochemistry or the physiology. The person in the next booth gets the same case. 32-year-old man with epigastric discomfort, maybe a little blood in the stool, maybe not some blood in the stool. And the person at the next booth gets asked, ooh, untreated, what is the pathology of what develops? Untreated. What does that gastric ulcer become? And he has to say, is it adenocarcinoma? Hyperplasia, dysplasia, acanthoma. Ooh, and you have to be able to say, ooh, it's not a squamous. Squamous is in the proximal esophagus. Oh, it's not a teratoma. That's in my ovaries. I know about that. <laughs> oh, yes, I got teeth in my ovaries. So maybe your question will be that you get asked the pathology of what it becomes and you have to pick it out as an adenocarcinoma in the stomach. Oh, no, but maybe you get asked a question that says, oh, what's the pharmacology of the therapy? And you either get asked to know what the location is of the proton pump where you have to use omeprazole, rebeprazole, esomeprazole, lansoprazole, pentoprazole, some kind of prazole, or you get asked the pharmacology and microbiology of using clarithromycin and amoxicillin for your helicobacter. So Cramathon takes the 12 hours where you will do two hours of physio, two hours of farm, two hours of micro, two hours of bath, two hours of biochemistry, an hour to commit suicide, and then two hours of synthesizing a few cases just like what I said, how do you take one case and make sure you can answer every single one of those quests? Then you become like the Dalai Lama and the hot dog man. What did the Dalai Lama say to the hot dog man? Uh, uh, <laughs> make me one with everything. Oh, that's, that's, that's a dad joke. Yes. Well, you know, it's not bad, actually, if there's a lot of theology in there. So <laughs> that's what the Cramathon's about. All right. That's awesome. So you, you did say it's uh, sort of like a marathon, and, and obviously any sort of 12-hour study session is going to be a marathon. But a marathon takes preparation, right? I, I don't Absolutely. know if this is where our analogy is going to break down. But if students want to participate in this, should they do anything or how should they prepare to get the most out of the Cramathon? Do you need to have a, a basis of something or can you come in cold and you'll get a lot out of it? Well, I think both. I think that you get more out of it if you've had some degree of preparation. But in this case, we've uh, the Cramathons, because we're in the review course Mode. endeavors yeah. mode. Uh, it means that you had to have studied beforehand. Now, in this case, you would not be able to say, oh, study these five things. I could tell you that we will do the ulcer case that I just described. Mm -hmm. So if you studied ulcers, you would be prepared. But I think that in this case, it's to take your studies that you've already done. Let's face it, everybody for each step one pretty much does about the same thing. They were all studying first aid and they're all studying new world. Yep. And the, one of the biggest mistakes that people make is they think, well, if I just study first aid and I just do you world two or three times, I'm golden. I don't think that's the case. Uh, I think that people should be doing extra materials. They should be doing other Q banks. They should be going across uh, to different sources to expand and deepen their understanding. But yes, this will take people's studies that have already happened. And the whole idea of the Cramathon is to find the holes in your knowledge base yeah. and to synthesize what you've already made. So yeah. yes, if you studied, it will synthesize what you know. If you haven't studied, it will show you a lot about how to think. And the other part is that if uh, it's to help a person who has already studied to say, oh, what did I miss? Because that's what a book can't do for you. It can't right. find out what you missed. And I think that's, I mean, the timing of it's Perfect, because May 7th is the point when most people are still going to have four to eight weeks of uh, dedicated preparation time. And if you've been listening along to the Study Smarter series by May 7th, you will have had a little bit in physiology, micro, biochem, if you haven't actually already started your dedicated preparation time. And the Cramathon would be a great way to synthesize some of what you've learned for free on the podcast and to identify the holes to prepare the rest of your study um, so that you can maximize your score, as you say on the 
on, on your uh, website uh, for the uh, Cramathon promo page. So, And I think the synthesis aspect is really why we wanted to include the Cramathon as part of our Study Smarter bundle, because it does bring everything together and complements both the Osmosis QBank learning platform that we have, as well as the physiology dedicated lecture, lecture series that we have from physios. So is this for mostly U.S. students or would international students also benefit? I, I really don't distinguish between I don't distinguish between these groups. That's uh, not my kind of medicine. Uh, my kind of medicine is uh, the Olympics, uh, and uh, which is that people should be able to come from anywhere, from any place and compete on the same level playing field. Yeah. Twenty five percent of all residents in the country are international graduates. The U.S. students have to compete with that competition and it makes everybody better. So are medical schools in the United States on average better than international schools? Well, hopefully not offending too many people, but the answer to that is yes, yeah. because they're tightly inspected. They have national exams and LCME happens to have extremely high standards in the U.S. schools. However, when you are taking, uh, there's 135 allopathic U.S. schools in the country, mm -hmm. but there's six, there's 600 in India. Ooh, five times more. That's quite the end there, isn't it? Yeah. So if you're taking such a large number of people, wow, you really have a fantastic competition. So I think that both groups benefit and both groups should see themselves as their sparring partners, but without destruction. In other words, 25% of the residents in the country are international. 25% of U.S. students were born outside the United States. And 25% of U.S. students, their parents were born outside the United States. So we should expect that three out of four doctors you see in the United States speak a language other than English in the home. Isn't that interesting? Yeah, absolutely. Friedrich uh, Schiller wrote the poem uh, upon which Beethoven based the Ode to Joy. The die, 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 die. O oh, ye millions, I embrace ye with a kiss for all the world. Yeah, that's what I see Cramathon is. We're going to give you a biochemistry kiss. A biochemical ode to joy? That's right. <laughs> well, if, if in terms of medical education, it approaches the level of Beethoven's ode to joy, then I think this is well worth your time, listener. Also, synthesizing the things that you do with your other QBanks with a short live experience is the right thing to do. Uh, look, if you're a person that had a hard time in medical school, uh, for people who had not great scores, for people who failed step one once, I think that the, the long, full mm -hmm. live courses, such as Kaplan does, are a better choice for that sort of person. Or for somebody who's got a visa issue internationally and has to acculturate, then you need that long course. And let's not be cute here and think that a one day course is the same thing as one of those long live six weeks courses. They are not the same. This is a highlights day to find the holes in your knowledge and to synthesize. This is like you got a uh, you want to learn how to play tennis and you ask the tennis pro to spend 30 minutes looking at your form. I look at it like that. All right. And then Thursday uh, the 6th of April at 8 p.m. Eastern time, you are going to do a little preview of the Cramathon via webinar, right? Well, what I'm doing on um, the 6th is I am taking a very high-yield organ system, and I'm taking cardiovascular physiology, mm -hmm. and we're going to do that as a little sample of what goes on in Cramathon, but the other part is just it's a warm-up. So we're not going to repeat the same section, that, and nothing I do in samples uh, is just repeated word for word in the Cramathon. Sure. Uh, so we don't do that, but what it is that uh, this Thursday – is to show you also how the modality works when we teach online. So this Thursday, April 6th, coming at you, April 6th, April 6th, Thursday, 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, is cardiovascular physiology, but it's, it is multiple choice questions uh, that will enhance your experience. It's question-based review. Awesome. And how, how do students sign up for that? By you can go to my Twitter feed and you'll see it there in the Zoom. The, the Zoom uh, link will be 
done okay. or if people have it sent out by email and email blasts, we'll be sending that one for the people in our email database. And you, my fine Patrick Beeman, will put it out over oh, your very fine inside the board's Twitter feed. That's right. So you can follow us or go to at Boards Insider or Dr. Fisher himself at C Fish. C Fish. I take it somebody had Conrad Fisher as a uh, Twitter handle at some point. Nope, 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 nope. I chose that on purpose. Okay. I want to, I want my initials are C Fish. You want to see Fish? Oh, uh, yeah, that's. Uh, you want to go fishing for medical knowledge and catch a good residency? Yeah, absolutely. So, all right. Well, let's talk a little bit about pharmacology. If you have nothing. Um, by the way, Patrick, you got to start learning. You got to start learning to laugh at my jokes, even if they're not funny. You're not going to be able to stay married for a long time <laughs> unless you pretend to find people funny, even if they're not at that moment. Um, so actually, Dr. Fisher, my wife was um, holding one of the earphones until just before you said that. So um, I am glad that uh, that she walked away for now <laughs> for that. <laughs> So, all right, a little bit about pharmacology. I laugh at my own jokes. Well, I'll tell you what's very exciting about this. This is the first time I've made this experiment of doing these things with a study smarter bundle. I like experimenting like that. We can't um, uh, see what we arise. This is how the great genetic mutations that create genius and breakthroughs by trying something new we haven't done before. So I, I love that idea of the recombination of new question banks, new physiology, new modalities and learning, and synthesizing them with a live experience. It's very interesting. So it's a very good experiment. That's why I wanted to do it, to be able to offer it to students, especially because the point you made about everybody's going to use first aid, everybody's going to use UWorld, that's true, and they should, but that doesn't really capture every learning style or what learning style is best for each student, there is something to be said for a visual and audio medium as can be offered through like the Cramathon or lectures um, via physio. It expands, I guess, the mind's ability to remember and synthesize information by looking at it through multiple angles, I believe. And I think exactly. the neuroscience of learning supports that as well. I'm excited. Exactly. I, I'll, uh, I'll be at the Cramathon. I will. I will gladly be there, too. Exactly. The, the thing about also when people um, uh, put all of their eggs in the one basket, we have to ask ourselves, what Q-Bank did all the people who failed use? <laughs> Ooh, they also used the same single question bank. Yep. This proves that it's just simply not enough. That's why you got to try more than one. That's why there's more than one Kardashian. <laughs> that's what, So that was funny. <laughs> Thank uh, you. So that's what I'm going to do. I think uh, originally I thought I'm not going to build a QBank, but now um, I think I will just so I can market it as the inside the board's question bank, the other Kardashian. Exactly. So let's do a couple of uh, pharmacology questions. Um, MedQuest has a brand new pharmacology question bank. We're over 300 questions uh, in about a month. It'll be 350. We're expanding it out. We have a fantastic guy that I work with, um, the uh, fa fabulous uh, Ahmed. And we uh, basically, he's a PharmD who's going to end up going to medical school, and he works on me with this. And they are probably hits every single thing. It's really complete, very, very thorough in all pharmacology. Let's see if we can do some questions verbally, okay? Let's do it. And you do get two weeks of the Farm Q Bank for signing up for the Cramathon or purchasing the Study Smarter Bundle. I forgot about that. That's true. Yeah. So, all yes, right. Yes, that's right. So you actually get this as part of the Cramathon. What a wonderful idea. Okay, let's go with the first one, all right? All right, let's do it. Here we go. We have an experimental intravenous drug with potential clinical benefit that is found to have a large volume of distribution. So when you have a drug with large volume of distribution, this drug is most likely to have which of the following properties? Will it be A, hydrophilic with a high degree of plasma protein binding? B, hydrophilic with a large non-ionized 
fraction. Hydrophilic with a low degree of tissue protein binding. D, lipophilic with a high degree of tissue protein binding. E, lipophilic with a low degree of tissue protein binding. Ooh, and the answer is, well, do hydrophilic things go across cell membranes easily or with difficulty? Hydrophilic with difficulty. That's right, because our cells, like me, likes to be covered in butter, in oils, in lipids. So the answers that say hydrophilic means that they stay in the plasma. So when you see the word hydrophilic, it stays in the plasma. Next, because you want to have a large volume of distribution, high tissue protein binding is best. So the answer is D, lipophilic, with a high degree of tissue protein binding, for two things. Lipophilic things go across cell membranes, and the more tissue, tissue, tissue protein binding there is, the more it disseminates and distributes through your cells. Next, if you have a high plasma protein binding, do you have a low volume distribution or a high volume distribution when you have high plasma protein binding? You have a a low volume of distribution. A low volume of distribution. A low, because if you're sitting there in the bloodstream, hugging that albumin, you're never going to get out of the bloodstream and go into the tissues. So therefore, the greater the plasma protein binding, the lower the volume of distribution. The greater the plasma binding, the lower the volume of distribution. The greater the hydrophilic, the lower the volume of distribution. Hydrophilic doesn't distribute, lipophilic does. Got it. Try the next one. 57-year-old woman with a history of prescription opioid abuse. Very trendy these days. It is. Uh, it's kind of like saying, yes, uh, which ethnic group sells the most amount of drugs in the country? Is it the Colombians, the Mexicans, the Dominicans? And the answer is doctors. Doctors. We have <laughs> largest drug dealers. So a woman has a history of prescription opioid abuse, and she goes to a methadone clinic where she gets large doses of methadone daily. She's been experiencing pleuritic chest pain and was diagnosed with a community-acquired pneumonia that got confirmed with a chest X-ray. The heart rate 70, normal. Blood pressure 118 over 80, normal. Respiratory rate 14, normal. Her PO2 in a blood gas is 80 with a pH of 7.37. And the EKG shows that there's a borderline prolonged QT. Seems like it's going to be important for this. Yes, it does, leading the witness. So this question is saying here, we have community-acquired pneumonia and you have a prolonged QT which of these drugs, which drug is the best option for treating the patient's pneumonia? Community acquired pneumonia with a prolonged QT. A, azithromycin. B, is it levofloxacin? C, doxycycline. D, cefepime. E, ciprofloxacin. So let's look at these choices. Azithro, levofloxacin, doxy, cefepime, ciprofloxacin. So let's go with the wrong answers first. Cefepime is not for community-acquired pneumonia. Cefepime is a fourth-generation cephalosporin. Or as those of you uh, east of the Greenwich Meridian would say, a cephalosporin. <laughs> so cefepime is for ventilator-associated pneumonia. Cefepime is for hospital-acquired, intubated, ventilator-associated pneumonia. Cefepime, usually cefepime and vancomycin. And that's to cover, like, for instance, some of the rare bugs like pseudomonas, correct? Yes, but pseudomonas is not rare if you're in the ICU. The same way exposed breasts are exposed breasts rare, Patrick? Um, 
Not if you're a gynecologist. True. They're that's true. common. <laughs> well, th- I'll leave that aside, but I, we always, <laughs> we get so many complaints uh, related to breast disease. Now but, Patrick is leaving his breasts aside. Okay. But yeah. you see, it's say pseudomonas is only rare in, in the community, in the ICU. It's common. Do you know why pseudomonas lives in the ICU so much, Patrick? Ventilators. Yes. What part of the ventilator? It's the moisture, the... Very uh, good. You should go... Thriving environment. I should go to medical school. You go to get a GED for an infectious disease fellowship. (laughs) Do they have those? (laughs) Yes, very good. It's called falsification. So cefepime is for pseudomonas. Pseudomonas is because pseudomonas likes water. And so does acinetobacter. They can live in a drop of water for years with no nutrition. Did you know that? A drop of water in ventilator tubing. I did not know that, but that is a little bit horrifying. That's why when you change the ventilator between patients, you must discard the tubing. And there's microbiology questions for you because the uh, USMLE loves to combine specialties. Absolutely. They love to combine. And that's why half of the microbiology questions our antibiotic questions. Absolutely. So cefepime is a fourth generation cephalosporin and it covers pseudomonas in an ICU, pseudomonas and acinetobacter in ICUs because they live in water. All right. So D cefepime is wrong because it's the wrong drug for the likely bug that she's. The wrong drug for the wrong bug. The wrong drug for the wrong bug. I'm going to use that. I like it. It's succinct. All right. What else? Now, ciprofloxacin is incorrect because ciprofloxacin is the only currently available quinolone that we doesn't cover pneumococcus. And what's the most common cause of community-acquired pneumonia? Streptococcus pneumonia. You are a genius. And actually, our, our next uh, mini micro episode is devoted completely to streptococcal disease. So stay tuned for that. Ooh. So cipro doesn't cover pneumococcus. Cipro covers gram negatives. Cipro will also cover quote unquote atypicals, which is mycoplasma, chlamydia, legionella, mycoplasma, chlamydia, and legionella. So that is incorrect. Okay. Now, why not azithromycin and levofloxacin? Do azithromycin and levofloxacin cover community acquired pneumonia? The answer is yes. The answer is yes. So that has to be wrong because the QT interval. The QT interval, the prolonged QT. Azithromycin and levofloxacin can prolong the QT. And if you give them to someone prolonged QT, then the patient dies. And you say to the family members, I've got some good news and some bad news. The good news is I treated the pneumonia. (laughs) The good news is the pneumonia is cured. The bad news is they died at Torsade de Blanc. So azithro and levofloxacin can prolong the QT, but the answer is doxycycline because doxycycline will cover community-acquired pneumonia, but it will not prolong the QT. Got it. Next one. All right. Oh, this is a simple question. I'll read this one. There you go. It's a definition, good definition to keep in mind. So the therapeutic index is defined as... A, the effective dose, 50 over the toxic dose, 50. The toxic dose, 50 over the effective dose, 50. Efficacy divided by potency. Potency divided by efficacy. Or E, potency times efficacy. So this one's bringing me back. But I remember this as the TD50 over the ED50. So toxic dose, 50 over the effective dose, 50. So I guess, what do those things mean for those who have not gone to medical school for nine years? Well, a therapeutic index, basically, it's a numerical value for how safe much a drug, drug is. <laughs> yes. First, well, how you could call it safe or you could also call it, on the other hand, dangerous. So a well, toxic I'm, I'm an optimist. So <laughs> Actually, that's not true. I'm a pessimist, but... So the, you see, the, there it is. There's a therapy. It's just very much similar to saying toxic dose. You see, if you need a very low dose of something to make you happy as an optimist, then the effective dose to make you happy is very low. So the therapeutic right. index will be high. 
Yeah. And if you need a very big dose of something to be toxic or make you pessimistic, it means <laughs> the therapeutic index is high. So therapeutic index basically is a numerical value for, hey, if a drug has a high therapeutic index, it means you need to give a ton, lots of it, to create toxicity. And if the drug has a high therapeutic index, it means you need a very small dose to be effective. So the high therapeutic index means Huge dose to hurt you, small dose to help you. Huge dose to hurt you, small dose to help you. That's therapeutic index. And then why the 50? Where's the 50, Patrick? Why the 50? You know, I always thought that that was somewhat arbitrary, but um, I mean, essentially, it uh, defines the half the population. Yeah, exactly. Treated- it says, it says, what's the toxic dose at which half the population will become ill? So, for instance, you could do a TD-99 and say, give me the dose at which 99% of people have toxicity, but that's not a very good measure if it kills 75% of people and you go, oh, look, you know, it didn't kill 99%. Like, no, 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 no. I want to know uh, which the average person gets toxicity. Right. And the effect, the effective dose for 50% means that it may be that you need a very, very high effective dose to reach out to, to the ends of uh, effective, effectiveness at like to get 100% to be effective. Now, what's the average? What's the average? What's the average? Yeah, yeah. yeah. This is important. Um, let's see if there's, maybe we can illustrate this by taking another question as well, like um, as an example. So do you want to move on to the next one and we can? Well, you know, the example was in the last question. You see, Azithromycin has a very high TD50. Right. Azithromycin is a very safe drug. So the dose you need to give of azithromycin to get toxicity is very high. Except what if you already have a prolonged QT? You see, here's another follow-up question. The therapeutic index of azithromycin changed in the previous question when the QT was prolonged. Right. Did it change the TD50 or the effective dose 50? It changes the, the TD. TD Correct, because what the QT prolongation does is it basically changes the dose at which you can cause toxicity. Right. Ah. Oh. So you got a guy, 53-year-old man's on Dabigatran or Dabigatran, whichever way you like to say it, Dabigatran. Now, the boards don't test manufacturers' names, but that is Pradaxa. For those of you who know it only as Pradaxa, Dabigatran, for his non-valvular atrial fibrillation. Remember that we should be using a NOAC, a novel oral anticoagulant, for atrial fibrillation stroke prophylaxis for everything except those people who have metal valves, everything except metal valves and mitral stenosis. So the guy crashes his car into a lamppost and has a motor vehicle accident. He's got bad brain injury. He gets airlifted to a hospital, and the scan shows a big epidural hematoma. His neurosurgeon wants to perform emergency craniotomy. So what are you going to give this guy? They always want to do that. Depends what hospital (laughs) you're at. Oh, that's a good point. If the epidural is big and you need to do surgery on a person who's been on dabigatrin, what will you give them before? You do the operation. Oh, so here's the mm-hmm. choice. First, A, bevacizumab, trastuzumab, nadalizumab, idarucizumab. Oh, my goodness. Who makes up these names? <laughs> yeah, this right. is like the names from from people who are like, this must be the people who make the names for Star Wars aliens. Yeah, um, well, choice E, uh, sec- secukinumab. Secukinumab, yeah, he's one of the uh, Sith Lords in the upcoming Star Wars. Exactly. Well, sacukinumab is a very difficult. Yeah, say, say, all these maps, right? And you're not allowed to be able to say to people, oh, uh, that the, it's just a monoclonal antibody. Sacukinumab is, is uh, an interleukin 17 inhibitor. Sacukinumab. And sacukinumab is for people um, who have psoriasis hmm. and IL 17 drug. So would you use vitamin K to reverse dabigatran? Dialysis reverse dabigatran. Is there anything to reverse dabigatran? Protamine sulfate to reverse dabigatran. Fresh frozen plasma to reverse dabigatran. Now, I will also tell you that here, this drug is the only one of the NOACs that has an agent to reverse it. 
The short answer is what reverses dabigatran, and it is ida rucizumab. What reverses dabigatran? Ida rucizumab. Let's say it together. Right. One, two, three. Ida, Ida rucizumab. Yeah. Now, bevacizumab. Bevacizumab. So actually, can I stop you or interject really quick? So you make a great point. Boards writers love this stuff. You said it's the only NOAC that has a reversal agent right now, right? Yes. So that seems to be pretty high yield because... You can write a test question off of that, such as this one. <laughs> well, the point about what you say is that it's like an IQ test. Which one of these is different from the other four? We have a, yeah. a pixaban, ribavruxaban, edoxaban, the 10A inhibitors, a pixaban, edoxaban, ribavruxaban. There's no agent to reverse them. Ooh. That's a bummer. Well, it makes it easy to write a question, though. So it does. the wrong answer is bevacizumab. Bevacizumab. Beva. Beva is, by the way, Patrick, what's the most common cause of blindness Oof. in the United States? Macular degeneration. Very good. Very good. Macular degeneration. Bevacizumab is a VEGF inhibitor that stops macular degeneration. It is a vascular endothelial growth factor inhibitor. Bevacizumab. There's ranibizumab and bevacizumab that stop macular degeneration. Stops it in 97% of wet macular degeneration and reverses one-third. Trastuzumab. Yeah, trastuzumab, you know that, Bobila. I do. What, uh, what is trastuzumab, Bobby? Booby? Booby? It's, yeah, it's for breast cancer. For boobies. That's right. Who's got breast cancer? Like one in eight women at some point in their life. Her too? Yeah, her too. Her she too? Does. That's what trastuzumab is. It's our HER2 inhibitor. HER2! Who's got breast cancer? One out of eight women. HER2! Trastuzumab. I like that. That's a mnemonic, too. See, all these little things are going to play back in your mind as you go to take step one. You're going to hear Dr. Fisher, if you go to the Cramathon, saying things like that, and it's going to stick. Who has breast cancer? HER2. Yeah. Trastuzumab. You'll remember it. Like a fecalith in your circle of willows. <laughs> what? <laughs> you won't be able to get me out of your head. Oof, that's graphic. You know, you know right. <laughs> you're pretty sensitive for a gynecologist. You're, I mean, you're pretty sensitive for a guy that does episiotomies, man. Well, no, I, I acquired this sensitivity. I used to be so much more... Hard. You should see I'm like covered in tattoos. I'm a hard-looking guy, but I was once told I have honorary ovaries and because you develop these things, you know, uh, <laughs> taking care of women. So God, you think that you know, the military vagina would toughen you up. <laughs> well, that's why I say I'm a combat gynecologist. Combat gynecologist. more hardcore. That is know? fantastic. So <laughs> natalizumab, what's natalizumab? That one I don't... No. For our audience, I think it's interesting you should see that. You'll look back at this as the first time that I'm doing a content-based uh, uh, review on uh, question bank questions. And, and for those of you that actually, if you're able to learn in this way, I hope you'll write in to us and let us know because uh, I was not certain whether you could actually do questions, multiple choice questions verbally only. But so many people seem to want things that they could listen to in the car and while they're brushing their teeth. Yeah, Dr. Fisher, that's that's why we have this podcast. Well, I it was a need. But it's an experiment, and I need to hear back from people. I need to hear that this is effective. I need Please, to hear everyone, everyone tweet yep. C. Fish. Tweet at C. Fish. Yeah, I need to hear what else people want in the podcast and whether it's effective, what we could do better. See, that's what you do And if you want to say to your residency director someday, you don't want to say, am I wrong about something? You say, is there anything I can do differently? Is there anything yeah, I can do differently? So I'm gonna, we're going to keep going on this and that you must send in the feedback so that we know what we can do differently to help your education. So natalizumab is a wrong answer. Because natalizumab is an alpha integrin inhibitor. Natalizumab is used for multiple sclerosis. Natalizumab is used for, to prevent progression of multiple sclerosis. But the question you're going to get asked on step one, besides it being an alpha integrin inhibitor, is that natalizumab has a unique adverse effect. Nata, nata, Liz. Nata, N A T A L. Natalizumab causes PML, it unlocks the JC virus. 
JC virus, which does not stand for Jakob Kurzfeld or Jesus Christ, but the John Cunningham, the first patient who ever had it, Nita Elizumab, is wrong because that's an alpha integrin inhibitor for MS and for inflammatory bowel disease. Vitamin K reverses warfarin, but is too slow. Dialysis does not reverse any anticoagulant. And protamine sulfate. Protamine sulfate is taking salmon testicles and putting them into a food processor so you get a salmon testicle smoothie. Ooh, how nice. And what is protamine for? You'll know it because it's old. Protamine sulfate reverses. Reverses heparin. There you go. Gotta know that one. There you go. Fresh frozen plasma reverses all deficiencies, reverses all deficiencies of, of factor, factor deficiencies, reverses all factor deficiencies, except... Ooh, is it factor eight? Oh, very good. Patrick shoots. Patrick got the rebound. Patrick scores. And since I got that right, I just want everyone to know that that was from memory. <laughs> That's it. But I, I use a FFP occasionally. Ooh, okay. Let's add on to this one for extra bonus points for the brand new car uh -oh. in the dream home in Cincinnati. <laughs> what reverses severe warfarin overdose, Coumadin overdose, and the answer is not fresh frozen plasma. What? Cryoprecipitate? Eh. Thank you for playing. Uh -huh. Cryoprecipitate is the wrong answer, but an important choice. Cryoprecipitate is high in fibrinogen content. Cryoprecipitate is used for dick. Oh, no, I'm sorry. D-I-C. It's used for <laughs> D-I-C. Well, I guess then just factor, um, recombinant factor seven, right? Close. 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 Uh. Close, close, said the ectopic pregnancy. I was close to the uterus. You're in the fallopian tube. So close, but still not close enough. <laughs> Consult medicine. <laughs> so let's say the question again. What reverses severe warfarin toxicity, INR of 10, severe bleeding, and when you absolutely, positively got to reverse it overnight? How do you FedEx those factors? And it's not fresh frozen plasma, and it's not vitamin K, because vitamin K is much too... Too slow. No. Exactly. Vitamin K is like uh, masturbating with myasthenia gravis. You get tired and it goes too slow. <laughs> the fastest way to reverse warfarin toxicity is prothrombin complex concentrate. Prothrombin complex concentrate. Great. PCC. Now, ladies and gentlemen, just like we said that the Cramathon was to find holes in your knowledge base, if you're doing this as an audio only right now, this is the type that you should pause, write that down, and look it up. Do not think that you're going to learn things just from one shot through. Prothrombin, okay, let me do my, here, I'll do my official podcast version. Ready? Let me count it down. Hey, hey, my show. I'm going to count it down for it. Three, two, one. Prothrombin complex concentrate is a collection of all the vitamin K dependent clotting factors. Factors 2, 7, 9, 10, protein C, and protein S. This substance, PCC or prothrombin complex concentrate, is the fastest way to reverse warfarin toxicity and is created specifically for warfarin overdose. It gives you only the factors that are vitamin K dependent. That was perfect. Do you like that? Yeah, yeah, you should. That's what you want to do more? Okay. Yeah, exactly. You, I need more of these. Uh, you, you'll have to record these segments for me. We'll put them in the, uh, integrate them into the uh, transitions of the show. That'd be perfect. You have a great radio voice. All right, we'll do those. Okay, i just show you that they can be socially appropriate if I try. Okay. All right, back to the question. So Idaruzizumab. Idaruzizumab reverses dabigatran. You know, I will tell you that I will think we'll do more of these because I like this more than I expected to. So dabigatran, the reversal agent, Idaruzizumab. Let's do the next one. All right, one more. I don't want to take too much of your time. I let's say do two let's... more. Let's do two more. I'm having a good two, two more. Two more. They're short. They're short. Okay, okay, okay. Uh, so a 70-year-old <laughs> woman with osteoporosis and a T-score of negative... 2.5 by DEXA scan, comes to the physician for a health maintenance examination. She takes adequate supplements of calcium and vitamin D. Which of the following drugs 
should be used as the first line therapy to reduce her incidence of hip fracture? Answer choices are A, calcitonin, B, raloxifene, C, teraparatide, D, alendronate, or E, my favorite, estrogen. So the first thing to do is to see that all of these choices do treat osteoporosis. Absolutely. And that can be a frustrating experience for a student when you're on an exam. Exactly. Forgetting that it is the single best correct. answer. They might all be correct answers. It's the single best answer you're looking for. Yeah. So alendronate is the answer because uh, bisphosphonates inhibit osteoclasts. And bisphosphonates, by inhibiting osteoclasts, prevent bone from being broken down. Now, calcitonin also inhibits osteoclasts. How come calcitonin was the wrong answer? And that's because calcitonin exhibits a phenomena called tachyphylaxis. What's tachyphylaxis? Body gets used to it, drug doesn't work. There you go. So calcitonin wears off. But where it, when is calcitonin the answer then? It's the answer for? It's about a third line, so in the need to immediately, for short short bursts of treatment, whenever that would be indicated. Correct. For acute hypercalcemia that needs an instant response. When you have a patient with acute hypercalcemia and they have mental status changes, abdominal pain and polyuria, and your hydration has not been effective, calcitonin works much faster than bisphosphonates. Calcitonin works fast, wears off fast. Now, See, there you go. what is raloxifen? Raloxifen keeps the bone hard. It's a serum. It's a serum, a selective estrogen receptor modifying drug. Selective. It's selective because it hardens my bone, but inhibits my breast cancer. It hardens, it's agonistic on the bone, but antagonistic on the breasts. Reloxifen, tamoxifen, tamoxifen, reloxifen to harden my bone and protect my breasts. Terry paratide. Terry paratide. Who is Terry? What is Terry Paratide? Terry Paratide is a synthetic version of parathyroid hormone, PTH. <gasps> oh, but fishy, fishy, fishy. How could PTH harden my bone? Oh, very good question, Johnny. Terry Paratide, although it is parathyroid hormone, takes advantage of a very important mechanism in physiology for step one called downregulation. You see, under constant exposure, parathyroid hormone will actually downregulate those osteoclasts. So it is the intermittent exposure to PTH that breaks down bone. Terry paratide gives a constant blood level of parathyroid hormone, so it actually blocks PTH effect on the bone. Ooh. Estrogen hardens your bone. It does. So how come we don't use estrogen first? There must be a reason. Uh, women's health study initiative mainly, I think, but that might be a little too detailed for step estrogen? one Estrogen? No, I don't think so. N knowing no. the name of specific studies is not necessary. Step one's never going to say, what was the name of that study that did this? So, you no, know, the, the name of the study is not necessary, but the point of the study was very important. The point of the study is that they'll ask you, if estrogen hardens bone, how come it's not used first, second, or third in old ladies with osteoporosis? Do you remember that thing we called therapeutic index from the Paleozoic? Vaguely. Yes. Therapeutic index said what was the toxic dose divided by the dose for efficacy, dose. the effective or efficacious dose. So estrogen is effective in hardening bone, but it's also toxic. That's what killed estrogen. The study you referred to is called the estrogen is more trouble than it's worth study. <laughs> estrogen does. At least in the media. Yeah. <laughs> Does estrogen harden the bone in a lady? Yes. Absolutely. And speaking as a premenopausal man myself, definitely. Estrogen hardens. Premenopausal? Yes. Estrogen hardens my bone. Yes. 
Now, the other thing is, why didn't it work? It was studied. It was studied, and what ended up happening is that more women died of DVT, pulmonary emboli, and weirdly enough, cardiovascular disease. So the toxic dose did not make, was not worth the drug. Preventing the osteoporosis was less than causing adverse effects of DVT, PE, thromboembolic disease, I see, DVT and PE, sudden short of breath, I see, DVT and PE, estrogen should not be inside of me because I got some good news and some bad news. You're going to have the greatest bone density in the funeral home. <laughs> That would not work as a marketing slogan. So I think we got to stop, man. And so we will stop. That is the one and only Dr. Conrad Fisher. Thank you for listening. See you back next time. Thank you to Rao Reynolds and Enter Shikari for letting us use the track The One True Color off their 2015 album, The Mind Suite. As always, thanks for listening. If you like what we're doing on the Inside the Boards podcast, please subscribe to our show and leave a rating and review on iTunes. We sure appreciate it. Good luck studying. See you back next time.